How do you follow that? Hi. Great job, guys. Thank you so much. I, I have brought my favorite, favorite mother on the stage, my wife, Jeannie, and she's gonna help me a little bit this morning. So, and it's good to have everybody here. Welcome today. Happy Mother's Day. You guys look amazing this morning, online campus. Welcome all you guys as well. Thank you, Tim. Our guests and visitors, thanks so much for being here today. Mother, uh, it's, a, it's the, probably the most challenging job on the face of the earth. And yet the most rewarding, right? Moms, you know what I'm talking about. The very most rewarding job function on the whole earth. So we wanna honor all the mothers, all those mothers who cook for us, right, cereal? And that's what we heard about cooking that cereal and whatever else that was, or, or, or turned our house into a home, made it a place where everybody felt loved. Moms were great at that, just making us feel loved and, and cared about. Mended our boo-boos. Uh, if you got small children, all you need is Band-Aids. I don't care if what they do, there's never any blood, but we get the Band-Aids out and we put them on them and the, the better ones have all the pictures on there. Those are special Band-Aids for, for little kids, little boys, and my mom put plenty of those on me. Uh, co consoled us in our times of disappointment. There's nobody like mother. I remember when I was really going through a tough time and I was at Bible school and uh, it wasn't dad that I called, it was mom. Because mom would understand, mom would hear, mom would, would know. And, and then also cheered us on when we did something good. Even not so good, she was there cheering. So at our games, even though we struck out at the plate or we missed the basket or whatever it is, mom's still there in the stands cheering us on, right? That's, that's what mothers do. And so very, very special. Um, instructed us all about life. And that's the biggest thing I think we learned from mom. And I will tell you, I was a handful for my mother, so she's in glory right now, but she had her hands filled with me. Yes, a lot of rewards for getting me through. But we wanna take a moment, we're honoring mothers today, and I would just like all the moms in the house to stand up. Let's give it up for our mothers right now, everybody. Look at these ladies. Man, you guys are amazing, we love you, you mean so much to us at Faith Church. Thank you for being with us today. your button there. So I'm, I'm really technical here. Yeah, there we go. Try that. There we go. Can you got me? Okay. It's so good to be up here today and see all your faces and get, get to wish you all a happy Mother's Day today. <clears throat> I love uh, the opportunity to speak to you. Thank you for letting me preach with you today. <laughs> so how many of you love to hear a good miracle story? <laughs> Miracles are what I love to hear. And as ministers... Through the years, we've gotten to hear tons of great miracle stories. Stories of marriages being restored, stories of people being healed from cancer or serious illness, um, stories of addicts who have come to the Lord and have laid that life down and they've been, been saved and set free. Stories of sons and daughters who have been gone on their own and they've come back the prodigals coming home and coming back to Christ. All those wonderful miracle stories that we love to hear. But have you ever looked at somebody's story or heard somebody's miracle story and inside yourself you're saying, but what about me? Where's my miracle? You know, I think we all tend to, to do that. We look at somebody else and think, where's that for me? You know, we love the Lord and we thank him for all he's done in our lives and we trust him but we think, what about the healing that I've been waiting for? Or what about that job promotion that I have wanted for so long and I keep getting passed up for that? Or what about that addiction that I keep falling back into? Or ladies, uh, sometimes it seems like you look around and all your friends are getting married, getting pregnant and having children, and you might say, why not me? You know, it's like that disappointment, that hurt. Why hasn't God given me my miracle? Is it a problem with my prayers? Is it a problem with my faith? What is the problem? And even today, for so many of our ladies, Mother's Day is a difficult day, and for men as well. But moms may, or ladies, maybe you've wanted to have a child, and as of yet, not, that has not been happening. Maybe thoughts of your own mom are a little painful because she wasn't the ideal mom that you grew up with. Or maybe your mom is not here. You know, I think about a lot of families this year who have lost their moms and wives. 
Many moms are also grieving the loss of a child, either through miscarriage or right. sickness or something tragic has happened, and you miss them dearly, or you think about them often, or the parent who's dealing with the prodigal son or daughter. And so many single moms who have the challenge, through no fault of their own, of raising those children alone. The father is not in their lives, or maybe they are, but they're distant, they're not in the home. And then maybe some of us are reminded of the abortion that we had in our younger years. And we're thinking today on Mother's Day about how old that child would be. What would their personality be like? Or what would they look like? All those things. And it hurts. Our prayers are with you through all of this. We want you to know that God is a God of comfort and Amen. strength. Right. And he will give you the grace and strength to face all that you face and to answer those questions that you have. Today we're going to look at a story in the Word of God and a true story of a woman who found herself barren. She was unable to have children and conceive and she was asking the question, why not me? If you'll stand with me, we're going to read our passage from 1 Samuel 1, 4 through 7. And it says, whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife, Panina, and to her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, and the Lord had closed her womb. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Father, we're so thankful for your word and for the lessons that you give us in it. I pray today as we look at this uh, life of Hannah, God, that you would help us to see something in our own life that you want to let us know about, that you want to teach us. Open our hearts to hear your word, open our ears to understand, and I just pray, God, that you bless the, this service today in your name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Not only is... Uh, Hannah Barron, but to make matters worse, she's uh, got a rival for her affections. Her husband actually has, Elkanah has two wives. And so I can't imagine trying to handle two. Uh, but, but two wives, and, and, and to make matters worse, the second wife, Peninnah, has a bunch of kids. And she's got kids everywhere, so every time uh, they, she sees her rival with all these kids, it's a reminder that she's at fault. You see, we didn't, in infertility, you don't know whether it's the, the man's fault or the wife's fault, but it's very obvious that it's all Hannah's fault. She's unable to have children. And, and she looks and it grates on her and she sees that day after day. Now, now you get the idea from the word of God that Hannah is a, a, a godly lady, but Peninnah, on the other hand, is kind of a cruel mocker. And so, not only does she have all the kids, but she rides Hannah about it and says, look at me, look at all my kids, look how amazing they are. Uh, sorry about you, sorry that didn't happen. And she just kind of digs and rubs it in and this goes on year after year, day after day, and she's reminded of all that happening. And she's wondering, why not me? Have you ever felt like that? Have you ever wondered why especially the wicked seem to prosper? Somebody who's a, who's a mess up and messed up their life and done all kinds of bad stuff and yet somehow they seem to get blessed and they fall into blessings all the time and, and I'm trying to serve the Lord and I'm doing the best I can and God doesn't answer my prayers and I'm going through this stuff all by myself and I, I think we all come there at some time or another in our experiences in life. Why, why not me? Why hasn't it happened to me? And then on top of that, as you look at the scripture very close, look at verse five again. She's, if, it, if it's not Hannah's fault, then it's God's fault. And so there's this kind of blaming of God that goes on here, and you see in verse number five, and it says, and the Lord had given her no children. So right away, all the attention is focused on God, and this hasn't happened to me, and, and it's God. And then it gets even stronger in verse number six. It says, the Lord had kept her from having children. And so it's, it's tough enough when I can't have kids, but, but now as a lady of faith, God must have his hand in this. And when something happens and we're trusting God or we're believing God, it doesn't occur like we think it ought to, we can get frustrated. If we're not careful, we'll take our frustration out on God and we'll say, God, why not me? Why is 
she blessed and I'm not? Why do they get this and I don't get this? And, and on and on it goes. I wanna make three observations from this story. And if you're taking notes, you can jot these down. You can find them online as well. First of all, you need to understand problems are gonna come. They're gonna happen to every single one of us. Problems will come in your lifetime. When you give your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ, it is an amazing transformation. In that moment, you have everlasting life, but it's not the guarantee you'll never have a problem the rest of your life. Life stuff happens. It just happens in our lives and it will occur. And it says in verse number three, year after year, after year after year, after year after year, after she prays, she's believing for the answer, trusting God, the same, nothing happens. Year after year, she would go up to the temple and worship and, and, and wait on God and, and meet God there and still nothing happens. Year after year, she believed and the answer is always still the same. Now I wanna give you, everybody in the house, a word of encouragement. And right here, just, just wanna pause for a moment here. There's a great example from Hannah of her faithfulness. And I wanna encourage you, don't stop praying, don't stop seeking the Lord, don't stop worshiping God. Even though your situation may be challenging or difficult, never ever give up. The other thing I wanna make note of here is she went to the tabernacle, she went to the temple, she went to meet God. She had, she had this compulsion that I've gotta to get to where God's people are and she makes her way to the prophet and she makes her way to Eli and she makes her way to the temple and there she cries out to the Lord. And I believe every time she went up to the temple she went with an expectation that God was gonna meet her there. I wanna encourage you, be faithful to the house of the Lord. I think we live in a time where people are getting very, very lax about the importance of the assembling of themselves together, the importance of the body of Christ, the family of God, and are connecting with one another in church and coming to worship the Lord as a corporate body. It's an amazing experience every Sunday. We had a great time this morning waiting on the Lord, worshiping the Lord. It's so, so important to our regular Christian growth. Now, I know this last year, and in fact, statistics show that the average church attender attends church 1.3 times a month. That means in, in, in a span of a couple of months, they'll go two and a half times, 2.6, I'm not gonna do the math, but you get it. They, 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 they're very rarely there and they call themselves regular attenders. Now we, we've all faced the pandemic and it swept across our land and so for a couple year, months we had to shut down and I am thankful for technology when even during when we couldn't have church we could still get the word of God out through the internet and, and all those kinds of mediums out there that we can use to get the good news out. But I wanna tell you, the online campus is never meant to be a substitute for the local church. And we've had people who've had to stay out, and I understand that. They had immune situations in their body, very elderly, very at risk, or we've even had caregivers who are taking care of those who are elderly or those who are at risk, and they could not risk getting COVID. And so I get it and I understand it, but I think what has also happened among the church is that we have used the great COVID excuse. And I've had people say, Pastor, I'm so sorry, it's COVID, I can't come to church, I won't see you there, but boy, I'll see him in Walmart, I'll see him in Lowe's walking up and down the aisle, I'll see him going out to eat every week. And so, so COVID, if we're not careful, becomes our excuse. And the danger is that after so many times of repeated activity, it becomes a habit. And the reality is, many believers have come in the habit of not going to church. And I wanna tell you, I think that's a dangerous thing, I think it's a dangerous precedent. I, I think we need each other in the family of God. Everything about Christianity is meant to do, be done in the context of one another, love one another, bear one another's burdens, care for each other, hold each other up, encourage each other in the Lord, greet one another with a holy kiss. I can't kiss you over the TV screen, I'm sorry. <laughs> All men in the body of Christ. So I wanna encourage you, let's follow that example of Hannah. Let's be faithful. Let's come ready to pray. Let's come ready to seek God. Let's come believing for revival. Let, let's come believing with an expectancy that, that I'm coming to the house of God and I'm gonna meet God here. There are some still watching online and we're looking forward to the time when you can come back and join us again. And many can't be here every week and so they have to watch online. And we got people watching from all over the country and we're thankful for each and every one of them. But if you're here locally, and it, it's time, it's time to come back to the house of the Lord. Amen. 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 
So Hannah was a woman who felt very blessed, but she also felt very cursed at the same time. You know, she felt blessed because she knew she was loved. Her husband loved her deeply, but yet she felt cursed because she was barren. How many nights do you suppose Hannah cried herself to sleep, wondering if she had done something wrong to chase God's blessings away from her life? How many times did the enemy come to her and leverage that opportunity to shoot discouragement right into her soul? Though Hannah struggled with her heartbreak, we never get the sense that it developed into an offense toward God. She was faithful. She was faithful in her prayers. She was faithful in her service to God. She was faithful to the temple. But even in that, and in the great faith that she had, she was on a roller coaster of faith, I'm sure. You know, every month when she would come to realize still no child, I'm sure that was a, a big disappointment. And she felt like she was on a roller coaster. Our scripture says that she found herself burdened to the point of weeping and not eating. Have you ever been there? I've been there. I've, I've known what that's felt like. When my heart was so heavy over a situation that I wasn't seeing the answer to, you know, I had those times where I couldn't sleep or eat. And I'm sure you've all had that as well. So you can empathize with Hannah. You know, it's possible to have great faith but still have problems, mm -hmm. just like you said. Sometimes life is just really hard, and we don't have to fake that it's not. We can be honest and real with God and with our friends and with the people who love us. And sometimes well-meaning folks can just add to your pain by questioning your faith. You know, I remember a time when it was very popular to think that because you had a, a trial or because you weren't being blessed, you must have sinned or you must have a lack of faith. And I don't believe that's true at all because God says the sun shines on the just and the unjust. We will all face trials and troubles. You know, people can't understand sometimes why you just can't be joyful. And sometimes they don't know what to say. But in just wanting to say something to try to make you feel better, they say the wrong things and that doesn't help at all. Hannah's husband was a loving, kind, godly man. There was no doubt that he loved her, but he had a major flaw. And that was that he just thought like a man. You know, men try to fix our feelings. And that sometimes just can't be, happen. We just need them to, to be there and hold us. But here in verse 8, he sticks his foot in his mouth. And this is what he says. And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? And why do you not eat? And why is your heart so sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? Wow. Can you imagine a man saying that to his wife in her sorrow? He just didn't make her situation any better. Elkanah was not a model of someone that we want to look at who empathized with another person. When we're trying to comfort someone and looking for something to say, saying, well, at least you have, and fill in the blank for whatever it is, that still doesn't answer the biggest question in your heart of That's why right. not me, That's God? Right. Why isn't my prayer answered? Why is the desire of my heart not met? The enemy wants to convince you that your need is too small That's or right. that you are just too selfish to take that need to God. So we suffer quietly alone in our pain. Year after year, as the scripture says, we struggle with pain and hurt, thinking we're the problem, rather than returning to a loving God who has more, far more for us than we could ever imagine or think. We'll all have days of ups and downs, and God will be with you every step of the way. But stay tender and trust him. Don't allow the hurts you've endured to keep you from running to a God who is waiting for you with open arms. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jeannie. So the bottom line is we all have problems, but I want to take you to my second observation, and it's simply this. How do we handle life's problems? What do we do in the face of these problems? And I think we can learn some powerful lessons here from Hannah as well. First of all, she stays committed to faith. She is, her faith is gonna soar even in these times. Look, if you would, at verse number 10. It says, in her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. And so she keeps praying, she keeps seeking God, she never, ever gives up. And I wanna tell you, that's some of what faith is all involved in. 
It, 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 we take it to God, we believe, we trust. So she runs to the Lord and she's very honest with God and she shares her emotions, she shares her feelings, she holds nothing back and she begs God for what she desires. You see, here's the, here's the situation. Often when we don't get what we want or we need or our miracle or our answer, sometimes we lose trust in God. And we say, God, you must not be out there. You must not care about me. You must not really love me. And so we kind of give up on God. But it's in those times, God wants to lean in, in us into him more than ever before. Instead of pulling away from God, it's a time to get closer to God and rest on him. That's what real faith will do, and that's really what it's all about. In fact, it's in these moments of waiting that, that God can use his tools to teach you to trust. Teach you what faith is about. Teach you to believe. Her petition and her fervency was so great that Eli thinks she's drunk. And so she's, she's in the temple, she's on her face, she's crying, she's weeping, her mouth is moving, but no sound is coming out. And Eli says, lady, you're not supposed to bring your alcohol in the temple. You know, what are you doing in here? What are you drunk in here for? And then Hannah, the Bible says, explains to her why she is so fervent, why she's so passionate. He explains, she explains to him about her, her barrenness. And look what he, Eli responds in verse 17. And Eli answered, go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. Now, hearing the word of Eli, she receives it as if it were the word of the Lord. And all of a sudden, this peace floods Hannah's heart and life, and she's filled with peace. And the Bible says in the next verse, her countenance was lifted, and the joy comes back all over again. And she begins to rejoice in the word she had heard from God through Eli. Now, now, I want you to get this. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of the Lord. And once that rhema word is dropped into Hannah's heart, she hangs on to it with a, with a great, amazing faith. She doesn't let go. Now, nothing had changed in the natural. A at that point, she's still not pregnant, obviously. She's, she's still barren. Nothing has changed in the natural, but, but she begins to rejoice in the Lord. She begins to eat her meals. She, this peace of God floods her heart because she's holding on to the word of the Lord. God is not finished with us yet. And even in those seasons of waiting, even those times when we don't understand what may be going on around us, God's not done. Look at verse number 19. Early the next morning, they arose and worshiped before the Lord and then went back to their home at Ramah. Early in the morning, they went to worship the Lord. There's something that happens in the spiritual that's unlocked in Hannah's life. So she goes from petition, begging, intercession, and now she moves the very next day into a place of worship. I wanna tell you there are times in your spiritual journey, your spiritual experience, when you've asked God, you've asked God, you've pleaded, you've sought the Lord, you've kept knocking on the door, but all of a sudden God will drop this word into your heart and life and say, it's okay, I've got this. And then we begin to worship and praise and glorify God. I want to tell you what may be happening around you, no matter what's happening, God is always worthy of worship. He's always worthy of our praise. In fact, I believe when you can worship and praise God in the midst of your trial is the greatest expression of faith you can ever exercise. And so she worships the Lord, she praises him. Some of you in the house may have been struggling with something for a long time and year after year you've been seeking God. Year after year you've been waiting on him and nothing seems to happen. That There's no promise kicking inside your womb of faith. It's not there. Everything seems like it's the same. But the next morning, this shift occurs in the heavenly realms and she, her praise and petition, her petition changes into a platform of worship. God's worthy, God's worthy. Jesus, the Lord, is our way maker. He's our miracle worker, amen? He's our promise keeper. He is the light and the darkness. That's who our Lord is. And then the third observation I wanna make is simply this. Look at the result of her trusting in God. Pick it up again with verse 19. Early the next morning they arose and worshiped before the Lord and then went back to their home at Ramah. Elkanah made love to his wife, Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son, and she named him Samuel, saying, because I have asked 
for him. I want you to notice those five words, in the course of time. Everybody say that with me. In the course of time. When God's perfect time had come. In the course of, it's in those seasons of waiting. It's, it's, it's in that course of time. Sometimes we struggle with what's going on around us, but how many know God's timing is always better than our timing? And, and when God tells us to wait, we gotta trust God that he's got the answer, he's got the perfect time, and it is gonna come, and we believe God. At the time God had planned, God's timing is not ours. Sometimes we don't understand what God's been doing until he completes his plan. And so we're in the middle of the mess, but then God comes along and answers, and we look back and say, aha, I got it. I got it now. I see what you were doing. I see how you brought me through. I see how you're with me every step of the way. And I, God, I see how you worked out that miracle in your perfect time. Craig Rochelle makes this statement. A waiting season is not a wasted season. God's delays are not denials. I wanna say that one more time for you that are in that waiting season. A waiting season is not a wasted season. God's delays are not denial. Behind every trial, there is a purpose that God has for your trial and his timing is always right. And so I've gotta learn how to trust God, how to believe, how to have faith, even in the midst of my trial. Hebrews 6, 12 puts it this way. So, so we do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherited what God has promised. I, it's that second part of those two things, faith and, uh, faith and patience. I, I struggle with the patience part. We want God to move. We want him to move right now. And if it happens like we think it do, we get very, very impatient. But he said, those who struggle with faith and patience, what? Ultimately inherited the promise that God had for them. That's exactly what you've seen happening in the life of Hannah. Notice the progression of the word word there in the, in the scripture. This is all about, 1 Samuel is about hearing the word of God and acting on what God tells us to do. It's an, it's an amazing book. And so she believes the word of the prophet Eli as if it were the word of God. She holds on to the word of God and that's where her faith kicks in. And that's where countenance changes. And that's where she would become pregnant because she hung on to the word of God. Let me give you one word you can always hang on to that is in the word of God. And we know that in all things, everybody say all things, God works for the good to those who love him, to those who are called according to his purpose. I wanna encourage you, hang on to that word. God has a plan, God has a promise, and he has a purpose for your life. Hannah makes a promise in response to God's gracious gift of a child. She says in verse 22, and Hannah did not go. She said to her husband, after the boy is weaned, I will take him and present him before the Lord and he will live always there. And then jump down to verse 28. So now I give him to the Lord for his whole life. He will be given over to the Lord and he worshiped the Lord there. Now, can you imagine how hard it must have been for Hannah who waits year after year after year for a child? Now to take that child, take your son, and take him to the temple and leave him there? I mean, this has been her longing desire for all these years that she would have a boy and now she leaves him in the temple in the hands of Eli, who wasn't all that great. She leaves him there. You can imagine what a challenge that must have been but I wanna tell you, for you that are worried about your kids and mothers, I, I, I don't wanna put anything on you, but I, ladies can worry sometimes. I'm not gonna ask you by show of hands. And sometimes we become so worried about our kids. Are they gonna get into drugs? Are gonna marry the wrong person? Are they gonna be, are they gonna get a job? What are they gonna do? And, and we worry about our kids all the time. I wanna encourage you, give your very best to God, give them to the Lord, because I will tell you, his hands are a lot stronger than yours. Mother, you can't always be there. You won't always be hovering over them as a helicopter mom. And so there comes a time when you release your sons and your daughters and you say, God, they're yours. You can handle this. You're bigger than I am. And you give them to God. H how do we give our kids to God? We do it in prayer. 
and, and we seek the Lord and we wait on him. And so your prayer might go something like this, Lord, take my son or my daughter. You protect them. You keep them. You guard over them, Lord Jesus. And God, even now, begin to prepare a spouse, a godly spouse for my son or my daughter. Start praying that now, even when they're small. They gotta bring the right person into their life. And then you say, God, I give them to you. Whether you call me a pastor or a missionary overseas and leave this country and leave me, God, they're yours, I give them to you. Or whether they're gonna be a doctor or a custodian or a fireman or a policeman or whatever you have marked out for them to do, God, I pray they will serve you for all of your glory and honor and praise. And when you pray a prayer like that, you are doing exactly what Hannah did, you're giving them back to God. We had an amazing group here yesterday at the church all day. Put that picture up there. These are the families who came in for our baby dedication and they did exactly what Hannah did. They gave them their kids back to God and they dedicated every one of their sons and daughters to the Lord Jesus Christ for his glory, for his honor, for his praise. Some of them might be in the house today. Give it up for these guys. They, they, they are they're taking their small children and very early saying, we want our kids to follow and serve and know the Lord. That, that, that's a simple act of dedication. And I'm gonna tell you, please don't bring your children to Mar and leave them in the church somewhere. Uh, we, we got enough going on around here, and so, uh, yeah, don't bring them here. I, notice also, she names him Samuel because I have asked of the Lord. I want you to look at what it said about Samuel. It says, she took him to the Lord, and it says, and Samuel worshiped in the temple there. Immediately, what Hannah has been doing is gonna pass down from generation to generation to generation, and now it's gonna through, go through Samuel. And because Hannah is a woman of prayer, Samuel becomes a man of prayer. And because Hannah is a woman who knew how to worship the Lord, Samuel is gonna worship the Lord in the temple. And, and because Hannah is faithful, to go to church, to go to the temple year after year after year. Samuel's gonna live inside the temple. And so you see this going down to the very next generation. And I want you to look at one verse as we kind of bring this to a close. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 26. And it says there, and the boy Samuel continued to grow in stature and in favor with the Lord and with people. Where have we heard that before? Jesus, exactly. It says in Luke 2 and 52, and Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and with man. And so you almost see Samuel is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ in his upbringing, in his learning how to hear the voice of his father. Jesus Christ knew exactly everything his father wanted. He knew his father's will down to the, to the minutest detail because he knew how to hear the voice of his father. And Samuel was the same kind of prophet and leader in Israel. So follow it here. Hannah believes the word of the Lord. And by the way, let me tell you something about faith here. And I quoted earlier, Romans 8, 17, faith comes from hearing the message and the message is heard through the word. And yet, even though God would speak through Eli, we read in 1 Samuel 3 and verse one, in those days the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. Now, why do you suppose in Eli's generation the word of God was rare? It wasn't because God was not wanting to speak. It was because they were not listening. There is something about learning to listen to the word of God. God wants to speak to every single generation, but because Eli was not listening, because his sons were defiling the temple of God, because it says the, the word of God was rare, rarely heard in those days, right? Right? But Samuel's different. Very early, he's gonna to learn to hear the voice of God. And three times, Samuel will hear God speaking to him. And Eli has enough wisdom to say, the next time he speaks to you, say, say speak, Lord, thy servant is listening. Speak, Lord, thy servant is listening. He is gonna be a great prophet for Israel. He's gonna unite the whole nation of Israel under God for the first time in a long time. And look at 1 Samuel 3 and verse 19. And the Lord was with Samuel and he grew up. And he let none of Samuel's words, there's that phrase again, fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet 
of the Lord. So that you see the uniting of the people of Israel under what? The voice of God. Look at the next verse though. The Lord continued to appear at Shiloh and there he revered, revealed himself to Samuel through his word. Wow. And what became of Hannah? You say, well, man, she gave her son away. She's alone. She's by herself all over again. No, God blesses Hannah. She's going to have three more sons and two daughters. And he makes her very fruitful because she trusted in God. She believed in the Lord. She, she gave her very best back to God. And God, in turn, blessed her womb. And she gave birth again and again and again. Listen, I want to challenge you today. God is a miracle-working God. There is nothing he cannot do. And he always keeps his word. And so I, I want us to remove from this idea of why not me to why not me? Why not me, God? I believe you have a miracle for me, and I believe God's gonna reveal himself in the house today in a, an amazing way, and that some here are gonna move from doubt to faith or from barrenness to blessing. Hallelujah.